And we're just a few weeks from Easter, and we're going to begin a new series today that I'm, I'm excited to, to get into. I, I just had this crazy thought, like, what, what are we going to talk about leading into Easter? And I was just, I just had this thought, like, what if we just talked about Jesus? <laughs> That's what this series is all about. Um, there's a lot of practical things the Bible gives us to help us with our lives, like the Bible talks about relationships and money and it, it speaks into family issues. There, there's really nothing you're gonna experience in this life that the Bible doesn't give us wisdom into. And a lot of times when we're doing series, we're trying to help just bring the wisdom of the word of God into, into some things. But uh, I just wanna tell you the greatest thing that I could ever tell you about is a man named Jesus Christ. Like that's the greatest thing I could ever tell you about. And we're gonna spend a few weeks and just leading into the Easter season, Easter's coming up, I, 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 that boggles my mind because I swear last week we were having Christmas services here at Coast Life Church and uh, now we're having Easter services and there's six services to attend and we, we wanna resource, resource our church. So there's invite cards and posters and tattoos that we just want to be conversation starters and we're gonna be dropping uh, some social media content for you to like and share. Uh, as we invite our community to experience the power of the resurrection. And so uh, I want to pray over you and just believe with you that as you prayerfully invite people, that there are people in your world who are waiting for an invitation to come to Easter services. They're looking for where to go. And so we want you to invest in someone and invite. And you can go ahead and register six services. They're already filling up. It's an amazing thing. Uh, but they're already filling up six services. You can go to mycoastlifechurch.com and register for our Easter gatherings. And today I'm gonna try to turn our hearts towards uh, Jesus. And we're gonna, we're gonna begin a series called My Truth. And it, it's, it's tempting and it's popular to try to define the world the way that we see it. To, to define what's real. There's a search for what's real. And when you're trying to determine what's real, it's tempting to define it on our own terms. But really the only person that has the authority to define what's real and what's true is the one person who walked out of the grave 2,000 years ago, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that has the authority to define what is right, what is true, what is real. Like, uh, to be clear, I, I'm a pastor and I wanna preach truth, but I don't get the privilege of defining truth. All I can do is point to the one who can define truth. And it's, and it's popular for people to tell their story. And it's, it's a desire to be heard and just, just define themselves. And, What's amazing is Jesus actually defined himself. And in the book of John, and we're gonna go through some of these, I'm not gonna be able to go through all of them. In, in the book of John, Jesus makes seven I am statements. And if you wanna, if you wanna get into a little Bible study to prepare your hearts for Easter, I, I would encourage you to start working through the book of John and reading some of these seven I am statements. And I'm, that's what this series is about, is I'm gonna unpack some of these I am statements that Jesus made about himself. It's, it's, not, what, it's not what someone thought Jesus is. This is who Jesus declares that he is. And it traces all the way back to the book of Exodus chapter three when God showed up in a burning bush and Moses said, who shall I say is sending me, and the voice from the burning bush came back and said, tell them that I am that I, I am. And then Jesus steps on the scene and says, you know what? The I am that I, I am, I am. <laughs> I am. And he begins to make I am statements. And we live, we live in a culture that is uh, becoming less religious but more self-righteous. <laughs> like we all want to define what's right. We want to make the world right. We want to make our world right based on the way that we view it. And there's a, there's a pastor from Australia that I, I enjoy listening to his podcast. His name is Mark Sayers. And he said that this culture that we live in, if you, if you read social media 
and you watch the news, everyone is trying really hard to be, to be moral, like there actually is. Even, even immoral people now define their immora, immorality as moral, um, and we're all trying to define what's moral, and then we cross each other because all of us in our culture, it, we're trying to create a world that's right. Right in our eyes, but we're trying to create a world that's right. And Mark Sayer says it this way. He said, people want the kingdom without the king. We want to create the kingdom of God. We want to create utopia on this earth. We want to create a place where the lion lays down with the lamb. We want to create a place where, where men study war no more. We want to create a place where uh, everyone is treated with justice and there is no injustice. And we want to create a place where there is harmony and there is no brokenness. But the way the culture is trying to do it is they're trying to produce the results of the kingdom of God, but not bow our knee to the king of the kingdom of God. And one of the things that we get asked a lot as a, as a church in this culture um, is what's the deal with the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament, have y'all ever read the Old Testament? The Old Testament's crazy. Like, it's, it's crazy. It's like that uncle that tells wild stories. And you're like, that stuff didn't really happen. And he's like, no, I, I did it back in the 70s, man. I was, I, like, you're like, no, no, no. Like, yeah, and that, that stuff really happened. Like, there's, there's all kinds of brutal wars in there. Uh, there's uh, polygamy in there. Um, there's uh, incest in there. Uh, there's rape in there. There is incestuous rape in there. Um, and it wasn't, the Bible wasn't even written in Arkansas. It was just like, I, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Arkansas. I'm from Arkansas. I grew up in Arkansas. You can't make that joke. I can make that joke. <laughs> it's a wild book. There's this harshness. There's like, there's this voice of God. If you read it, I, my Bible reading has been taking me through Jeremiah, and if you ever wanted to need to go on antidepressant medicine, just read Jeremiah for a little while. Like, it, it's, it's depressing. They like just constant God speaking doom over people. And there's, there's infanticide, there's genocide, there's all of this stuff in there. And in our culture today, it's tempting to try to try to make the Bible fit into what we think is culturally right. And can I just tell you today that that's not the way this works. We don't submit the Bible to culture. We submit culture to the Word of God. And it's tempting to sanitize the Bible, to remove some of the hard things in there, and to try to explain it away. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't explain it away. And people go, what's the deal with the Old Testament? I could, like, there's slavery in the Old Testament. I could, never, I could never serve a God like that. I could never serve a God that would allow those things to happen. I, I, that, that image of God, I could never serve a God like that. And when we say that, we're saying, I could never serve a God like that who made the sun shine on me today. I can never serve a God like that who is the one that's going to make the stars shine on me tonight. I can never serve a God like that who created the trees that are producing the oxygen that is being processed through the lungs that, by the way, God created for me. And those lungs are helping take oxygen into the bloodstream, the bloodstream that God created for me, that's being pumped by the heart that, by the way, God created for me. And it's taking blood to all the vital organs in my body, including the brain by the way that God created me that allowed me to even have the thought that I could never serve a God like that because all of creation testifies to the glory and the power come on somebody and the preeminence and the goodness of our God like all of creation testifies to that could never serve a God like that well to be fair God is the creator amen somebody but before God created man God created something created a garden called Eden. And it's very important to know that God created Eden because God, before he created man, 
created a place for man. And if you wanna know what this is all about, is God, God created people because God wanted a people, but in our hearts is a desire to have a place. And so God, all through the Bible, makes this exchange. If you will be my people, I will give you a place. And God has a place for you. God has a place for you. And before God ever created man, he created a place for man, and then he planted Adam and Eve in the garden. He put them in the Garden of Eden, and it was a place of his presence. It was a place of purpose for them. It was a place of dominion for them, and it was a place where things were right in their life and in their world because God has a place for you. The problem is, is not only did God create a place for them, he gave them the ability to make their own choices. And this is where we could have a talk about whether or not that was wise on God's part to allow human beings to have the ability to make a choice. Because there's one thing that we really suck at, and it's making choices. And I got told last night that maybe I shouldn't use the word suck, so let me say it this way. If there's one thing we're crappy at, it's making choices. We don't choose very well. And man made choices that took them out of that garden, that took them out of that place of God's purpose and plan, and right out of the presence of God. And when you talk about the Old Testament, I, I want to set something straight. Eden is the place that God created. The Old Testament is the world that we created. Like all, all of that chaos and all of that murder, and all of that war, and all of that slavery and infanticide, and all of that poverty and injustice, that wasn't in the world that God created. God created Eden, a place where there was no sickness, and there was no war, and there was no racism, and there was no hatred, and there was no injustice, and nobody was living in poverty, and everybody, they had what they needed, and they were fully provided for. If you wanna know who God is, look to Eden because that's who God is. If you want to know who we are, just read the Old Testament because that's what happens when the inmates are running the asylum. That's the Old Testament. Like that's, that's, that's the inmates running the asylum. What's the deal with all of that? Well, that's when we were in charge. And so God, God establishes some laws. Like, let's, let's, let's try to create some order in this insanity. And so there are actually 613 laws in the Old Testament. And it ranges from don't eat shrimp to not sleeping with your sister. Some of them we keep, some of them we don't. You can eat shrimp, still a good idea not to sleep with your sister. He gives us a law to try to help us get back to where we were belong, but the law doesn't help us. It only shows how incapable we are of being in the place where God wants us to be, that we can't do it on our own. And so you see this predicament that the law doesn't change us. It only exposes us for who we are, and that is we are people who make bad choices, and we cannot choose good to save our lives. And so we step into this moment where people live in this tension of there is this Old Testament that is full of judgment and a harsh God that has vindication and there are these harsh laws and then we talk about the New Testament where there is this idea of grace and mercy for every moment and God is good and he loves me unconditionally and there is this amazing God that has plans for my life and what is the difference? The Old Testament is what we deserve. The New Testament is what we don't deserve. It's what I don't deserve. I, do, I didn't earn it. I didn't get it. And what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And I just want you to understand this. Jesus makes the difference. He is the difference between the Old and the New. That I, I deserve judgment. I deserve condemnation. I, I deserve everything that happens to me. All of this sickness and brokenness and chaos and, and, and lack of peace in my 
my life. That's the result of my own choices, but instead I get grace, I get goodness, I get mercy, I get favor. I didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. Thank God Jesus came to this earth and represented who God is, and Jesus makes the difference. And in every human heart, there's a longing for home. There's a longing to be back in that place where we were created to be. To be back in the place where things are right in our world. It's in your heart, it's in my heart. We're, we're trying to navigate our lives because instinctively, why, why are people like hashtagging their pain and hashtagging the, what, everything that's wrong with the world and what's been wrong, done wrong to them and fighting about what's right and why, why are people doing that? It's because we instinctively know we were made for more. We were made, you and I, we were made for more than this. This world, this world, this is confusing, but this world is our home, but the world as it is is not our home because Jesus is gonna bring a new heaven and a new earth and that world's gonna be our home. And I, I feel like I'm preaching today. I don't know, I'm just, uh, I got a little, okay. All of us, every person in this room, the choices we make are because we're trying to navigate our lives back to the place God created us to be. Are you ready for this? There's a problem. We're crappy at making decisions. We make decisions based on our feelings. We make decisions based on our emotions. We, like Adam and Eve in the garden, make decisions based on half-truths. So someone gives us a little bit of truth, but not the whole truth, and we make a choice based on that. And like Adam and Eve, we make decisions that navigate us away from God's plan and God's purpose. And then we live in the reality of our choices, and then we say things like, God, where are you? And God's like, I'm where I've always been, walking in the cool of the evening, trying to get back to your heart. I'm trying to get back to you. And we live in this mess that God didn't create, the mess that we created. So let's, let's don't blame God for the choices we make. Because we, we, we are not just, and I, and I realize there's things that happen in this life because we live in a fallen world that are not fair, so I don't wanna pass over that. I don't wanna pass over that. We can be victims of our circumstances. But can I tell you, more than being victims of our circumstances, we are all products of our choices. We're all products of the choices that we make because we're navigating life through a faulty system of our own desires, our own emotions, our own feelings, and our own understanding of truth. That's why the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end doesn't take you, you ready for this, back to the place God created you to be. Like it seems right, but it doesn't take you back to the place that you're supposed to be. So we live in this place of brokenness and we carry guilt and we carry shame and we carry remorse and we carry rejection and we carry pain and we carry all of this stuff. And the more that it, the more that it marinates in our lives, the, the more we make decisions that are taking us further away and this relationship feels right. So I think I'll get acceptance there. So because it feels right, then I'll try to take the acceptance, but it's not really acceptance, it's conditional acceptance, it, it feels like love, I've had this conversation before with people who were going into relationships that weren't godly, and I'm just saying to them, I, I know that it just feels like love to you, I know that feels like love to you, but it's a false form of love, because the only place that you're going to find love is in the place that God put it, and that's in the place that he created for you. And so we're navigating this life and we get into all of this trouble, but the Bible speaks into this, John chapter 14, verses one through two. Jesus said this, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me, 
there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? God has a place for you. Jesus came because he was going to prepare a place for you, that there is room for you, that God is creating a garden for you, that there's a place for you. And the question that comes up immediately after this from the disciples is Thomas who says, Lord, how do we know to get where you're going? We, we don't know how to get back to that place that you're saying is being created for us. And the question on, it, that's imprinted onto every soul, and the reason why I know that is because eternity is planted in the human heart. And the question that is on every one of us is, how do I get back to that place? Because I know that I was created for more than this. I was created for more than this world that has rejection and hatred and injustice and betrayal and all of this brokenness and all of this hurt. Like I know I was created for more than this. So how do I navigate my life from this place that is in a broken world that is not what God created me for, where I am living by my feelings and I'm making choices on what seems right, but it's a faulty navigational system and I'm trying to get here and the law didn't help me get to where God created me for. How do I get from here to the place that God has for me? And Jesus says this in the book of John, right after John 14, one through two, Jesus said this in the book of John chapter 14. He said, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go back to that place with the Father except through me. That I am the navigational system of this life. That where you are and where God wants you to be, you can't get there through your feelings and you can't even get there through trying to be obedient to a law. So I'm going to step into this life and I'm going to be the navigational system of this life that's gonna take you from the broken world into the place of wholeness that God has for you and I'm gonna be the way, the truth, and the life. And I, 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 I love a good navigational system. Like I, 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 was, I was in another place this week and I, I got there and I, I, use, a, I use an app and I, I, I was, I'm gonna say it, I had a falling out with my app yesterday because it wasn't working at a crucial moment. But I'm gonna go ahead and say it. But are, are there any Waze users in the room today? Like I love, I love Waze and I, I landed and my phone wasn't working and I was at a rental car place and I, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna navigate because I had no clue where I was at. And the, the, the young lady behind the counter was being so helpful and she was like, uh, sir, I can offer you a map. <laughs> and just for a moment, I had to wonder what a map was. Like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, that's not gonna help me at this point. There was a, there was a day that would have helped me. Today ain't that day. I, I am not gonna make it. And we were able to figure it out. But what I love about Waze is it's not a map, is that it's a navigational guide. Because what's cool is it's on everybody's phone. So it knows that there's people ahead of me that are going the same direction. And I'll use Waze even here in our local community, even if I know where I'm going, because how many of you have ever been stuck on I-75 wishing you were on 41? And how many of you have ever been on 41 wishing you were on I-75? And Waze goes ahead of you, and it tells you where the detours are, and it tells you where the traffic backups are, and it tells you the things to navigate around. And here's the incredible thing is not only did God give us his word, not only did he send his commandments to us, and not only did he give us a map to say, hey, this is where you are, but you weren't created for that. You were created to be in this place of wholeness and healing and this place where your world is right, not based on your rightness, but based on God's rightness. And so I'm gonna give you 
a map that's gonna show you the direction to go, but not only am I gonna give you the map, Jesus came into this world not to just show us the map, but to just walk the path ahead of us, because you ready for this? Jesus is the ways of life. He goes ahead of you, he finds out what's in front of you, and then he says this, you don't have to navigate your life, you just put your feet in my footsteps and you just walk the path that I've already walked because I'm gonna walk you from where you are to where God intended for you to be. So all you gotta do is just follow me and I'll take you to the place that brings you back to the Father, that brings you back to a place where there's acceptance and healing. And so when you're tempted to get into that relationship that you know you shouldn't get into, all you gotta do is just say, instead of following my feelings, I'm gonna follow the path that Jesus laid out for me. And when the tempter of this world is offering you the kingdoms of this world, if you'll just follow your flesh, and follow your feelings, you can say, I'm not going to live by the bread of life. I'm gonna live based on every word of God that proceeded from the mouth of God. I'm not gonna make decisions based on half-truths that I thought of in my mind. I'm gonna base my life on one thing, and it is the eternal, settled, indisputable word of the living God that he's already spoken in my life. And when there's a cross in front of me, and I know that I'm gonna have to lay me down. I'm going to put my footsteps in the feet of Jesus and I'm gonna take on the cross and I'm gonna endure the shame because like Jesus, I know that there's joy on the other side of laying my life down for something greater than myself, that I'm going to live for something greater than I am because Jesus is the only way that goes back to the place that you've been created for and that's not in your poverty and it's not in your shame and it's not in your guilt and it's not in your brokenness and it's not in your rejection and it's not in the injustice that's happened to you. Jesus is the way and by the way, he is the truth. He's the only truth. He's the only thing that's real in this life. He is real love. He is real acceptance. He is real approval. He is real adoption. He is the only way and he's the only truth and he brings us into life, abundant life and eternal life and we get the kingdom because we have a king named Jesus and neither is there salvation in any other name except the name that is Jesus. There is only one name that brings healing and brings hope and the old life that I lived with guilt and shame, the old life is what I deserve. The new life is healing and hope. The new life is what I don't deserve. And what's the difference between the old life and the new life? Jesus makes the difference. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life.
you bow your heads with me all across the auditorium? Later in John 14, Jesus would say, I'm not gonna leave you without a comforter. I'm gonna send the comforter to lead you and guide you into all truth, to lead you into what's real about this life, about what's true in this life. In this, in this room right now, that, that presence that you feel, that's different than being in any other environment. It's hard to arti articulate, but it's just different. The air changes. The ambience changes, and it's not just the lights, the music. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of Jesus saying, I want to I want to I want to be your navigational system. I want to I want to invite you to go back to the place that every relationship you've been in, you've been seeking to be in that place. Every substance you've tried to use to medicate to medicate a feeling. It, 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 was, it was a desire to go back, to go back to that place because we know we were made for more. No one, no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws. And right now, I believe all across this room that the presence of God is drawing us. The comforter is saying, let me, let me lead you into real love, into real acceptance, into, into real freedom. Today, we get to go back to where it all began by just simply making one choice. That's the choice to follow Jesus. All across this room, I wanna give you the opportunity. And maybe you're not someone who has their, their feet following in the footsteps of Jesus. I'm gonna give you an opportunity today to just make a choice to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer like this or maybe, maybe in the past you've been somebody who was on the path that would take you to abundant life, that would take you to eternal life. But today, if you were honest, you're on a, you're on a path that maybe, maybe in the context of culture and maybe in the context of the world, and maybe in the context of some half-truths, it, it seems right. But today, you know that God is saying, the end of that is destruction. But I want to put you on the path that leads you back into my plan, into my presence. Takes you back, takes you back home where you belong. And all across this room, I want to give you an opportunity to make that choice today. I like to count to three just because it's a clear moment to say today, I, I need to change the direction of my life. It's what repentance is. It just means turning to God. Today, I'm gonna to choose to turn my life and become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. If that's you today and you're not on the path, and you know the Spirit is drawing you. Today, I wanna to give you the opportunity to choose Jesus on the count of three. One, two, come on, this is your moment. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Three, say today, I wanna to, I want to become a follower of Jesus. Today, I make the choice to stop following my own path following my own feelings, following my own understanding. Today, I simply yield my life to God to follow Jesus. Father, I thank you for every hand that's lifted. I thank you for every person that is declaring in this moment that God, we are wayward. We are lost in our shame and our sin and in our addictions and in our struggles. So today, we just simply turn 
We become followers of Jesus. We receive what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. We lay down our sin and shame. We turn from that old life. We step into a new life full of your goodness and your grace, full of your provision and your hope. Today, we declare that if any man, any woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And the difference is Jesus. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said a great big amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a great praise. Today.